In January, Dr. Charles Leiber, chair of Harvard's chemistry and chemical biology department, was charged by the FBI for lying about his ties to the Chinese Communist Party. It was found that he entered into a contract to help run a Chinese university's research lab without acknowledging Harvard. What you may not know was that this happened while Harvard had spent over 40 years trying to build a close relationship with communist China. And based on this case, Harvard likely hasn't got a good deal. But how did this relationship come about? And what does each stand to gain from it? The Harvard Opportunity In 1978, Howard H. Hyatt, the dean of the School of Public Health at Harvard, at the time wanted to explore the possibility of an institution-to-institution -institution relationship with China. The CCP jumped at the opportunity, excited to begin a relationship with one of the most prestigious schools in the world. It connected Harvard with the Shanghai First Medical University. Even today, this project survives under the name of the Harvard-China Health Partnership. From that point, Harvard has been helping China with building its universities. In return, Harvard gained greater access to China's talent pool and research projects. Virtually every school at Harvard has a very significant set of engagements, teaching research, receiving students from China. It's a very deep, thorough, and long-term relationship with China. But until the close of the 20th century, the relationship between the CCP and the university has been asymmetrical, tipping in Harvard's favor. In 1997, former CCP General Secretary Jiang Zemin paid a visit to the U.S. During his trip, he stopped in at Harvard to give a speech. Harvard, although working with China, did not let Jiang's speech become a one-sided CCP propaganda. Instead, it allowed protests outside the theater and 15 minutes of unrehearsed student discussions. Here, Harvard protected freedom of speech on its campus. But will it continue to do so going forward? The Second Central Party School Harvard's relationship with the CCP continued to deepen. Starting in 1998, the CCP has been sending its selected officials to study at Harvard. The Ash Center at Harvard's Kennedy School. Every year, it hosts a group of up to 40 Chinese government officials for a month as part of a special program called China's Leaders in Development. You might hope Harvard would teach them how to turn China into a democracy and run proper Western-style elections. But in reality, Harvard wouldn't teach something the CCP doesn't want to learn. And instead, it has been providing courses that include crisis management, leadership, and public management. The curriculum seems to not only help improve the party's control over the Chinese people, but also give the party a better understanding of the U.S., which is now its strategic rival. And what they'll often say to me is, look, we don't necessarily agree with the decisions the U.S. makes, but at least we understand the political process behind that and why America makes the kinds of decisions it does. The most prominent graduates from the program consist of China's former vice president, Li Yuanchao, and former commerce minister, Chen Deming. On top of that, Harvard has accepted family members of top CCP officials, such as Xi Jinping's daughter and Jiang Zemin's grandson. The CCP has its central party school. No, it's not a school where you get to party every day. It is where uprising party members are sent to learn to become authentic communists. And because of its relationship with the regime, Harvard has become unofficially named the second central party school by the CCP's critics. Tipping the balance. China became the second largest economy in 2010. With that comes the CCP's increased influence and ambitions. Since 2013, hundreds of universities in America have received funding from the CCP and its affiliates, totaling over $1 billion. Harvard, as the largest target, has received about $100 million. But $100 million is perhaps insignificant for a university with a $40 billion endowment. Research capabilities seem to be the real factor in tipping the balance between Harvard and the CCP. China's research budget has been gradually catching up with the U.S. since 2008. And after decades of development, its universities are now considered important partners by Western institutions. As Arthur M. Kleinman, a Harvard physician and anthropologist, put it, quote, In the past, it used to be that they had nobody, and we brought the ideas, the methods, and produced the findings. But now, they have plenty of good people doing good research. What we learn in China is as important for here in the U.S. as it is for China. What gives the CCP even more leverage 
is that Harvard is not the only top Western university who appears to believe that collaborating with its Chinese counterparts is necessary for staying at the top of the academic world. It has to compete with other institutions for access to resources under the CCP's control. On top of that, since 2012, Harvard has received an increased number of Chinese students and scholars, which it believes to be valuable to its research in the U.S. Each year, more than 800 researchers and doctors take advantage of exchange programs between West China Hospital and the renowned research centers in the United States, such as Harvard Medical School. But those talents can choose to go to other Western universities or simply stay in China, of which the CCP has a great deal of control. So how is the CCP's influence seen on Harvard's campus? The powerful person who cannot be named. On March 10, 2015, Tung Biao, a visiting fellow at Harvard Law School, was called to the office by a, quote, powerful person at the university. Tung is a human rights lawyer and Chinese dissident who had been outspoken about the Chinese Communist Party's human rights violations. He had planned an event that was going to take place at Harvard later that month. At the event, he and another famous Chinese dissident, Chen Guangchen, were scheduled to share their experiences. But when he arrived at the office, the powerful person demanded that Tung have the event, quote, postponed. Tung had no choice but to comply under pressure. To date, the event has not happened. This was the second time the powerful person asked Tung to postpone giving the talk. Back in February, the powerful person told Tung that his event would, quote, embarrass Harvard. I have to cancel the talk because Harvard president was uh, meeting Xi Jinping in Beijing. Tung didn't give up until being called to the office on March 10th, when the powerful person said his event might jeopardize Harvard's collaboration with China and give him a formal warning. Tung was also asked not to make the cancellation public. Although he revealed the cancellation later, Tung did not identify who that powerful person was under fear of losing his job. But sources later confirmed that the powerful person was Professor William P. Alford, Harvard Law School's Vice Dean of International Legal Studies. Professor Alford has visited China and met with CCP's leaders many times throughout his career, and later in an email, he admitted asking Tung to cancel the event. It seems Harvard greatly values its business with the CCP over freedom of speech. Paying the price. The tipping of balance explains why Harvard did not support Tung Biao's event. As he put it, quote, Western institutions, think tanks, universities, they don't want to anger the Chinese government because they want to keep a good relationship with their Chinese counterparts. But what does the university stand to lose from the relationship? Tung's case might be unique. Keep in mind, Harvard offered him the job knowing he's on the CCP's blacklist. And when the current Harvard president, Lawrence Bacow, visited China in 2019, he brought up China's human rights issues just before meeting with Xi Jinping. But this incident could open the door for self-censorship, and the likely consequence would be the loss of academic freedom. Besides, Western universities like Harvard face a more imminent threat, espionage. When the CCP provides funding for research, it doesn't simply pay Chinese institutions to work on new inventions by themselves. It wants results faster. And through the Thousand Talents Plan, it uses large salaries to attract overseas intellectuals to bring their knowledge and experience to China, and sometimes incentivizes them to steal Western technologies directly. In the case of Harvard, last December, a Chinese researcher named Zhao Song Zheng was caught smuggling biological materials out of a Harvard-affiliated medical center in Massachusetts. And in January, its chemistry professor, Charles Liber, was charged by the FBI for lying about its ties to the CCP and the Thousand Talents program. He was found to have entered a contract with Wuhan University of Technology, quote, to guide the advancement of disciplines or scientific research institutes to become first-class disciplines or scientific research institutes in China or the world, especially in frontier areas. Maybe it's fair to sum up Harvard's relationship with the Chinese Communist Party as such. The university gets green light from the regime to recruit China's talent and collaborate with its Chinese counterparts on research projects to hopefully maintain its academic leadership. In return, it helps the CCP catch up with the West in academics and technology, teaches its officials how to rule over China, opens the door for self-censorship, 
and at the same time has the regime steal from its back. Do you think this is a good deal? Leave your comments below. Thank you for watching Unseen Fortunes. If you enjoyed our content, please click like, subscribe, and share. We'll see you next time.